I want to talk about the rise of the sacred feminine. Clearly, Shakti is very active here in this retreat, but I want to delve a little bit deeper into the specifics of consciousness awakening in a female body. And I'm interested to know what the scriptures say. I have a feeling that the tantric perspective and Kashmir Shaivism in particular has more to offer on this than perhaps other um, disciplines. So I think a lot of this knowledge is currently being reclaimed through perhaps what we spoke of the first day in relation to memory and knowing, the inner knowing, um, which is arising in women as they are awakening at this time, which I sense there is a wave of that, perhaps particularly in women. So I would like to hear you speak to the womb in particular, perhaps with the same depth and subtlety that you've addressed the heart in the different dimensions of the heart because I feel like there's something very specific about the womb. Mm -hmm. I know you are in a man's body, but I'm curious, why is it that this feminine aspect of this process has been so absent from scriptures, from other seemingly enlightened beings, and I believe there are those, but it's never really addressed. And even now, I think many, I know there's a wave and it's becoming a bit of a, a you know, a thing to talk about at conferences. But it makes me feel like, what is that grace revealing aspect and what happens when you become, as you've experienced, enlightened? Does that reveal itself to you? Do you get a sense of the f female experience or is it limited to just your particular perspective as in your current incarnation? I would have thought that the inner knowing reveals everything by grace and you would see the dynamics. So then why has it been so silenced? Well, looks like we got <laughs> a couple of retreats cut for us. <laughs> Uh, yeah, great. Did you write it down? Yes. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. The rise of divine feminine is a term that by now firmly entered spiritual discourses of many circles and communities. It has been coined out, nobody exactly knows who by whom, but it already already has been in circulation for at least a few years and yes certainly we, we could say that we've added our voice to that but since there are quite few things that you brought out i would just respond in no particular order to kind of what, what comes first It is tempting to see the rise of the Divine Feminine in the same way as 
let's say, certain social movements like rise of feminism, which has history, right? Quite a prolonged history already. For example, there is a day, International Female Day, March 8th, which is celebrated in every um, Eastern European country, in all parts of former Soviet Union, in many countries with communist um, socialist history, because the feminism is inseparable from the overall movement, social movement for, for social justices. And it started in the 19th century, even before the 20th century. Can we see this rise of the sacred feminine in the same way? And I can see that it has been done quite, quite a bit today. There's these analogies, especially in social media. This maybe we can speak a little bit to that, so that we don't kind of brush everything with this, you know, don't paint everything with the white brush or with the same brush. Sacred feminine uh, includes both genders in equal measure. Yes, there are differences on the anatomical, physiological level, and even on, to a certain degree, on a subtle level between female and male physiology. But that different difference does not extend to the possibility and ability to transcend. Transcendence knows no gender. This is a very important understanding, because otherwise confusion can set in. And subtle, subtle identification with one's physiology will guide one's process where the whole point is to... Transcendence is transcendence. Transcendence is to simply see the form, any form, as a temporal manifestation, a phase, a transitory phase. You certainly may have been, in your previous incarnations, many men and many women. It doesn't matter whatever needed to be learned in any of the bodies has been hopefully learned so that now in this incarnation work can continue. The sacred feminine is in relation to the worship and the cult of Shakti. In other words, it's the way of seeing reality and way of relating to reality. But then you've asked to see how the tradition sees it. Tantra has many different schools, altogether 64 known Tantras, 64 known schools of Tantra. And some of them have more of a Shaiva perspective. Others are more colored by that Shakta perspective. Even within Shaiva Tantras of Kashmir, certain teachers of the same lineage may have master who have given his interpretations of some key shastras 
tantric scriptures with the emphasis on Shiva aspect. But his disciple would come and give preference in his interpretations to Shakti. It's almost as if designed to confuse the uninitiated. But they all speak about the same thing, because Shiva is Shakti. Shakti is Shiva. The silent aspect of life or existence and dynamic aspect are one and the same. These are different modes of expression. If someone sees the rise of the Divine Feminine as a kind of return to matriarchal way of life, then they may miss altogether the profound subtlety of what it represents. Because I see that, see that, how the polemic is being brought uh, not on a very intelligible level. The womb and the heart are one and the same. The womb and the heart. The womb as a original place and the heart as the original place are spoken interchangeably. The lingam and the yoni as the symbology of creation can be can be related to the organs but if it is not accompanied by profound level of understanding of what the human body is it will always be trivialized therefore it is not advisable to do that the verticality of lingam and the receptivity of the yoni is the symbol of all beginnings just as in rudra bishek that very very well known indian rite performed every year especially at the mahashivaratri when the milk is being poured over the lingam and as it poured down over the lingam into the basin of the reservoir which stands for yoni and as it moves out if we somehow all too readily confuse this with our physical organs and a lot of people do that a lot of people very quickly kind of you know want to draw the analogy then we miss the deep metaphysical meaning of the lingam the lingam spoken about here is a pituitary gland and the rudra bishak is the soma that pours down in the awakened one that is the real lingam not the member who gen- the generative member the lingam is in the higher cortexes this is the meaning of shiva lingam and there are many many lingams in the body just as there are many yonis so where does it take us you spoke about it, like i'm in a male body you in a female body Yes, I'll tell you the story first, maybe. Adi Shankara was, as you know, great scholar and sage and unbeatable and unparalleled in spiritual discourses. But he encountered this woman, Gauri, at one of the exchanges, which India is famous for, when everyone competes in their degree of 
spiritual knowledge, wisdom, experience. And when they met and begin to discuss, Gauri brought examples of <coughs> tantric union, which Brahmin Adi Shankara, who had never been with the woman, could not respond with anything. So, in order to continue this debate, as the story goes, he said, hang on a second, lady. Give me a week, a weekend break. Because, you know, I'm just a little tired from all these discourses. I need to freshen up my head. So, without hesitation, he entered meditation and looked around what's happening in the vicinity. And he saw that there is this sick king who had a fabulous um, assembly and beautiful wives. So, without hesitation, he entered the dying king's body and thoroughly enjoyed himself in the palace in the female quarters of it and learned what needed to be learned and returned. Yogis could do that, so he entered the body of the king, consciousness entered. And he came back and he defeated Gauri in the discourse because he was able to speak to that from direct experience. Of course, there's some bit of a continuation of that in the story that when the wives reported back to the prose of the recovered miraculously king, they start looking for that, for that, you know, sage who may be then captured, asked to enter the body of the king, and then beheaded. <laughs> so anyway, you see that um, all this is nice, all this is fabulous, and I said in my, in some of the maybe talks that you have heard, that female body can store more prana. I use the word store. It's, and it's, it's a fact. Prana is stored, just like everything else. It can be stored in the body. Stored and used. Because not all prana is in motion. Yes, prana's principal property is movement, but when it becomes the life force in the body, there are different pranas, mm -hmm. right? There are five principal different pranas. So prana is stored in the body, and female body has the capacity to store more prana. Therefore, from that point of view, female body, in a way, more... Um, maybe not the word more, but simply designed better for this process of transformation. Male body needs to go through a lot of specific, if you will, yogic procedures to have that capacity. And there is a tremendous renewal that is available to female body. Renewal, which is guarded and guided by the monthly cycles. Mm -hmm. So this is, these are the principal uh, advantages of the female physiology of a male when it comes to this. But it has disadvantages as well. And major disadvantages is that female clings more than male. Because now if we speak about the female and the male as manifestation or expression of masculine and feminine qualities, men are already detached. It's a psychological fact. Even the, the clinginess 
is of a different quality. Because female is meant to carry the life in a womb, meant to give birth. And for that reason, many spiritual teachers have encountered that, that it is that much more difficult for a woman to master this detachment from the female body because it is wired that way, you see? So nothing is a straight cut. So I just don't want you to end up with the romantic perspective of, right, of this rising of the sacred feminine and yes, The measure of civilization or the measure of the culture, there is this saying, is how this culture treats women. I've heard that and it, it rings true. So if woman is mistreated in any culture, that signals and heralds form of decay, decadence, degradation, any form, any form, in any form. So what are we going to lament now? Are we going to join the fragmentation of all this? You know, there's this continuous lobbying for minority, for this, for that, how this group of people, how that group of people being repressed. And now, there is this desire to rewrite history because somehow men wrote history. Men wrote history and most of the key characters are men there. So there is this voices, let's rewrite history from female point of view. Would it give us a better view on who we are as human beings? It's the same, the same quality of separate self speaking. You see? That that war between the genders <laughs> has to be maintained one way or the other. So that someone derives benefits from it or what, I don't know. The understanding that all of us have always been in it together Suffering of women did not men happier, far from it. Any culture we look into. So it is a joint affair. Ignorance has a price. And we live in the age of ignorance. Ignorance. So it is ignorance to blame, not to blame political party or men for usurping the power and, be, you know, denying it to women. With spirit, as far as spiritual process is concerned, as far as, far as the process of self-realization is concerned, there is a marked experience when the gender is simply bypassed. There's a threshold. And then there is no difference in the, in the realm of a spiritual anatomy. It, it's genderless. This is what this realm is spoken of as. That realm is an angelic and they don't have gender. As for experiences that you were sharing in that you have had at the level of certain parts of your physiology at the level of the womb that we all carry, you know, and that the ascend obviously has verticality. And in the verticality of the ascend, the first areas that where the work takes place is, as you know, the lower chakras, the lower psychic centers. So this is where the immediate work begins. So this is where a lot of people who go through awakening first experience this cleansing, healing, often pain, 
often some form of recovery through this area, in this area. If there is not much information stored in a psychic center, then the work will not delay there. The other, the opposite of that could be um, increased appetite for sensual enjoyment. Because it's activation of psychic center. It's an activation of psychic center. And it could be at the expense of expanding oneself through that very area. You see? So, that principle of conscious use of these energies is applicable to women just as it is applicable to men, but men are in more danger, obviously. Because men would be hit hard. Because the depletion of ojas is more apparent for men in the ejaculation. For women, it is less. Much less. But women's ojas can also be depleted, especially if it is in uncommitted sexual relationships of any kind. So the brahmacharya is still need to be met. But I don't want to go, on, but like, I'm not sure if it's for me, and I don't want to feed your imagination and to go into this. Yes, history is, is a nightmare from which we're trying to awake, like James Joyce said. It's a nightmare, but it's not all nightmare. This is our evolution. It's our shared, shared past. Why it was suppressed? Yes, it was suppressed because <coughs> it was feared. Any form, any form of spontaneity, any form which this uh, so-called feminine paths were known for are very, very opposite to what the organized religions really wanted. Right? When there is a strong connection through the earth, when there is a strong connection to the energy of the earth, then that individual has strength, independence, rooted. So you need to uproot that individual. And it's much easier to rule that individual through God who lives in the clouds somewhere, who lives somewhere, who created this earth and then thrown Adam and Eve to cultivate it because they were naughty. So, of course, the history of the way organized religion systematically destroyed any connection to pagan cultures is a case in the making of how all these practices in the West went underground and maybe were annihilated if they were, did not enjoy the pass, passage, if there was no possibility to transmit that wisdom from heart to heart and somehow to keep it alive. So it's now being recreated, yes, recreated. The work that we do here also is shamanic. It has strong elements, not because I'm shaman or because I'm sitting on a deer skin or reindeer skin. No, although it helps. <laughs> <laughs> but these elements are there on the account of working with these subtle forms of energy. Working, not denying them, not, not somehow. Again, just don't take everything, you know, just find out.
Yes, sometimes it's good when women gather together. And sometimes it's good when men gather together, because just as we speak of divine feminine, divine masculine just as much has been trampled. That emancipation touched both genders in not very good way. Men becoming infantile, boneless, spineless. They don't know what they are and what they really carry, what principle in this culture. Mm. They meant to do something, you know, that... So it's a, a lot of territory need to be covered. It's divine feminine and divine masculine in perfect union, in perfect balance, equilibrium. Because only when these categories are in equilibrium, then there can be any state of peace, bliss and beatitude. Because this is what it is. Any distortion causes any pulling, any, any tipping is being felt. So, we spoke about the sex a couple of days ago, and really the true union is a sublimation, is a sublimation of these primordial energies internally. So that sublimation is a sublimation of the archetypal masculine, archetypal feminine energies within, represent, represented by the element of fire and element of water. These are the, in the, at least in Indian spirituality, at least in Indian tradition, it is spoken of as the Ha and Ha, or as sun and moon. So, these energies are sublimated within. This is what brings peace and union. This is what brings a true sense of completeness. Otherwise, we are split, incomplete. So, yes, there is, a ma there is this gender and there is that gender. But our job is to transcend that gender. And through the process of sublimation, find togetherness and union of these categories within, so as truly embody that what we are. And still by going about our daily life in this form that is now being cherished, enjoyed. So... Thank you very much for all of that. <laughs>